What's up everybody and welcome to a very special episode today on the Engine Gremlin channel. Today's episode is brought to you by Street or Track and today we're going to be showing you how to install their front coilover suspension system. So stick around. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, today we're going to be showing you step-by-step -step how to install this front coilover suspension system from our sponsor, Streeter Track. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Streeter Track a little later in the episode, and in a couple of weeks, we will be releasing a very special episode of Ask the Experts, where I talk to Sean, the owner and co-founder of Streeter Track, about all things suspension. So don't forget to like and subscribe, follow along so you don't miss that episode, especially if you want to learn more about front suspensions. But without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So the first thing you're going to want to do when installing the suspension is to jack up the Mustang and then remove the front tire. Now if you've never jacked up a Mustang before, I highly recommend that you go check out CJ Pony Parts video on how to safely jack up an original or first generation Mustang. Link is going to be down in the description. Once we had the car jacked up and then we had the front wheel off, the then started by removing the export braces in the engine bay. Now the export brace is held on by three bolts at the top of the shock tower. These bolts have a square cut head that fit into grooves just underneath the surface of the sheet metal of the shock tower so that the nuts can be screwed on without the bolt turning on them. Now our first nut came off just fine, but as it turns out, the other two, well, Turns out that those square grooves had been rounded out, so we had to resort to some more drastic measures. Uh, we first started by using a screwdriver to try and apply some pressure to see if we could get enough friction to turn the nut off. That one didn't work, so then we moved on to applying some heat with a blowtorch. And when that eventually failed, we had to pull out the big guns and cut them off. Now, when you're cutting them off, it's okay if you you know, tear up the export brace a little bit because you are going to need an aftermarket export brace for this suspension system. Now the first one we cut off just by cutting the nut clean off and that worked great. Because of the angle of the third one, what we actually had to do was cut it straight down the middle of the bolt and then we just used the screwdriver and a hammer to uh, break it free. Once you've removed the bolts for the export brace, you're then gonna wanna remove the bolts at the top of the shock tower cap that holds the strut in place. Once you've removed those two bolts, you're actually going to go to the underside of the strut and you're going to remove the two bolts that hold the strut in place. Now one of the two bolts is actually pretty difficult to reach just from the side of the vehicle so we found it was actually easier to access from underneath the vehicle by using a couple of ratchet extensions and that actually made it very easy to access and get it unbolted. Once you have all the bolts removed simply remove the strut through the top of the shock tower. With the strut and the shock tower cap removed you can now remove the export brace bolts. So we have finally reached the point in the build where we need to remove the spring from the front suspension. But before we do that, there is a huge safety item that I want to address with all of you. If you do not own a spring compressor kit, the first thing I want you to do is go to your nearest auto parts store, whether that be Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly's, AutoZone, whatever your preference is, and ask for one of these. This is a spring compressor kit. You can rent them for absolutely free. You just have to put down a deposit. You get that deposit back upon return of the kit. Please, please, please go get one of these. What these allow you to do is to safely and slowly compress the spring just enough to, so that it can be safely removed from the vehicle and then just as slowly decompressed so that it releases all of that energy in a safe manner. This is really important because these springs can and will kill you if you do not give them the proper respect that they deserve. Remember, these coil springs are designed to react the entire weight of a multi-thousand pound vehicle at highway speeds. So we're talking 50, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. 
So these springs are able to absorb and release huge amounts of energy. And when they're in their compressed state, they're basically a grenade. <laughs> so again, please do the right thing from a safety perspective. Go get yourself a spring compressor kit. Um, we're gonna show you guys exactly how to use one so that you can take your spring out safely and effectively. So without further ado, we're gonna get to that part. Now to save yourself a little bit of time and effort, it actually helps to compress the spring a little bit. Now the easiest way to do this is to actually use a car jack and to use it to press up on the wheel hub. Now the wheel hub is then going to push on the control arms, which then pushes on the spring and helps compress it. Once you've compressed the spring a little bit, you're going to attach the coil spring compressors. Now the coil spring compressors are just simply a threaded rod that attach to the coil and then using a ratchet, you tighten them down to compress the spring. Now you're gonna wanna do this evenly and slowly on both coil spring compressors. That way you don't get any lopsided compression and risk the spring slipping out. Be sure to engage the locking pins on the coil spring compressors. This will also help to make sure that should you see any uneven compression in the spring that they don't suddenly lose their grip and the spring comes shooting out. Once you've reached the point where the springs have enough compression put in them and the control arms actually start to lift away from the car jack, you can lower the car jack back down and ideally the spring should come free at this point. However, sometimes you may find that the spring just doesn't want to come loose and so what you can do what you're seeing here, which is loosening the bolts on the spring perch. Now once the bolts on the spring perch have been loosened, you can then just use something like a pry bar or a screwdriver uh, to remove the perch and take the spring with it. Once you've removed the spring from the vehicle, you can safely decompress it by applying gentle amounts of turning to both Acme rods until it loses its full compression. Now, when you are decompressing a spring, make sure you are never facing the direction of the spring in case something should slip. The last thing you want is that thing flying right at your face. Now the next step in taking off the old suspension is going to be removing the cotter pins that hold on the castle nuts for the ball joints that hold on the spindle and the wheel hub. Once you've removed the cotter pins, simply remove the castle nuts on the upper and lower ball joints for the spindle. Now it's time to detach the steering knuckle. Just like the upper and lower ball joints for the spindle, start by removing the cotter pin and then remove the castle nut. If it's too difficult to detach by hand, simply use a dead blow mallet to detach the ball joint. At this point, it's time to remove the wheel hub. Now the wheel hub is held on by four bolts that connect to the spindle. Because these bolts see so much grime and wear and tear from the road, this is probably one of the best places that you can use a penetrating lubricant like WD-40 to help loosen those up. Once you've removed the bolts from the back of the hub, you're then going to remove the spindle cap, remove the cotter pin, then unthread the nut, and then finally take out the wheel bearing assembly. 
Now before you can actually remove the wheel hub assembly, you're going to need to detach your brake line. Now this is a good opportunity to either drain and flush your fluids, or you can simply crimp the lines closed and then you can bleed the brakes later after you've finished installing the coilover suspension. Now, our brake lines didn't have any fluid left in them and they were so crusty that it didn't really matter. They're going to be replaced anyway. Be sure to give your spindle a good wipe down. There's gonna be lots of old grease on there and it's just gonna help keep things clean and it's a good opportunity to replace the grease from your wheel bearing assembly. Once you've removed the wheel hub, you're then going to remove the nuts that hold the strut rod onto the lower control arm. Now you're not actually going to remove the strut rod at this point. It's actually helpful to keep it in place to help remove some of the other hardware. So at this point in the build of the front suspension, it's actually a good point for me to bring up a couple of opportunities that you might want to take advantage of. The first one being is replacing all of the bushings up here if you haven't done so recently, especially if they're the original bushings. All of those bushings are going to be dry, cracked. A great example is here on the sway bar. You know, these things are hard, they're cracked, they're dried. They don't really work like they were intended to anymore. They're 50 some odd years old so it's only to be expected so your control arm over here also has some bushing so it's a really good opportunity now you won't have to replace the bushings here in the upper and lower ball joints uh, just simply because they already have perfectly good replacements already on the tubular arm construction from street or track now the other part that you might want to take advantage of is using this opportunity to upgrade your sway bar. Now there's nothing wrong with the sway bar as it is, however it is kind of small. So as part of your build, if you have a higher horsepower V8 or maybe you've done some modifications to your engine setup such that you've increased the horsepower, you're going to be handling this thing pretty significantly around corners. Uh, it's a good idea to upgrade the size of this sway bar. As I said, there's nothing wrong with this sway bar, um, but it's a good opportunity to upgrade it if you plan on increasing the capability of your Mustang. It's also a good opportunity to replace the bushings in your sway bar too. Again, all of the bushings on here, if you haven't replaced them in the past or recently, are probably beyond repair or saving or using. Do yourself a favor and get yourself uh, a set of bushings. Bushings are relatively cheap for cars. Uh, and take the time to swap them out. So now it's time to actually remove the spindle and to do that we need to separate the upper and lower ball joints. Now what we're using here is what's typically called a pickle fork or a ball joint separator. Now a ball joint separator can be rented for free from any local auto parts store. To use it simply wedge it around the ball joint and then using a hammer hit the end of it until the ball joint well separates. Now, if you find that you're having trouble taking off the upper ball joint, you can cheat a little bit, which we're showing here. You can actually remove the four bolts that hold on the upper ball joint. This lets you then detach the lower ball joint, and then you can proceed to remove the upper ball joint when you've got it up in the vise on a bench top level somewhere. You know, something a little bit more accessible for you to swing a hammer. With the lower ball joint separated, if you haven't been able to separate the upper ball joint, you can now take your time doing it up on your bench somewhere. Ta-da! Piece of cake! And there we have our spindle. Now, if you're not going to be replacing your spindle with a drop spindle or an aftermarket spindle, this is a good opportunity to give it a good wash or clean and check for any cracks or any deformations. With the spindle removed, it's now time to remove the upper control arm. Now you're probably going to want to grease these up on both sides with some penetrating lubricant like WD-40. Once they've had time to penetrate, you're probably going to want to use a cheater bar to loosen them up on the inside of the engine bay. Once you've loosened the nuts, you can now completely remove them, and once you remove both nuts from the upper control arm, you can simply pull out the upper control arm from the outside of the vehicle.
Now, if you haven't done so already, now is the perfect time to remove the sway bar linkages that connect to the lower control arm. Now, you're going to want to do this on both sides of the vehicle so that you can move the sway bar up and out of the way so it's not in your way when you're working in the wheel well. Now, if you've removed the strut rod from the lower control arm at this point, you're going to want to keep it attached for this next step. This next step, we're actually going to remove the strut rod itself, but that's really difficult to do if it's free spinning on you. So you're going to start by removing the nut on the end of the strut rod towards the front of the vehicle where the strut rod bushings are. Once you've removed the nut, you can detach the strut rod from the lower control arm and then simply pull out the strut rod. So now it's time to remove the strut rod bushings since the new installation will not have strut rod bushings. Now normally these just pull apart and you can use something like a spreader bar or a pry bar to pull them apart. However, ours were so old and so rusted that they had basically welded themselves together and we actually had to use a grinder's cutoff wheel to make these cross like cuts so that we could then pull them apart with a pry bar. With the strut rod bushing removed, it's now time to focus on removing the lower control arm. You're going to want to start by removing the nut that holds the lower control arm in place. Now for some reason we had actually put the strut rod back in place and we're silly enough to leave it in place while we were working on this. Not sure why we did that. Once you've removed the nut, then you can remove the concentric washer. Now at this point you're going to want to remove the bolt that holds on the lower control arm. However, we found that the cross member actually makes it difficult to provide the clearance to remove the bolt. So at this point if you're having trouble removing that bolt, take the time to loosen up the bolts that hold on the cross member. You may find it's even easier to remove the cross member altogether. Once you've got the cross member loosened up enough, you should be able to remove the bolt with a little bit of fiddling and then remove the lower control arm. With the lower control arm removed, we're actually now ready to move on to the installation of the new suspension. All right, phase one complete. We have removed the old suspension, and honestly, that really wasn't too bad. That was about two to three hours worth of work uh, to remove the old suspension, and honestly, the worst part about it was just because this car in particular is so old and sat in the barn for so long, a lot of the bolts have gotten really rusty and crusty, and it just took a little time to let the WD-40 penetrate and we had to get a cheater bar on some of them. But overall, really not that bad. Uh, as I mentioned before, when you're doing the ball joints to get those off of your spindle, just make sure you run down to your local auto parts store, auto parts store and get yourself the uh, ball joint separator, AKA the pickle fork. Again, just like the coil spring compressor, uh, all you have to do is put down a deposit and then you will get that back when you return the kit. So it's uh, no skin off of your back and uh, your wallet stays a little bit heavier. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to the fun part, which is installing that front coilover suspension. Now we're using what's called a Shelby drop in our installation, which is a new set of holes that are required to be drilled in the shock tower. But before we can ever do that, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that the surfaces of the shock tower are nice and clean so that we have a smooth surface to mount up our template to. Now we found that a series of hand picks, a glass scraper, some steel wheels, and then some good old WD-40 was more than enough to clean off all the gunk and give us a nice smooth surface to mount up our template and then eventually drill into. 
So at this point, we're gonna pause for a quick minute and give you two tips that we picked up along the way while we were installing this suspension. The first one being is to remove the coil shroud. So this is the shroud that has your bump stop on it. Now, it doesn't explicitly say to remove the shroud in the instructions, but we found that when we were doing this, it made it so much easier. Now, you can install this suspension uh, with the shroud on. And in fact, for the first side, we did it just to prove that you can uh, and show folks that you don't have to remove it. But when we did the other side, we also took it off uh, to show that it's just that much better. And to give you some confirmation of that, you know, here on my right hand side, I've got an image of what it's like with the shroud on, with the bump stop. As you can see, it's we have to kind of crane our neck to look up at anything that we're working on. It's harder to get light in there. It's not much physical room to work with. And then here on the left, I have an image of what it's like to work with the shroud off. And you can see everything that you're working on. You have lots of room uh, and it's easy for light to get in there. So do yourself a favor, take the extra two minutes it takes to undo those six bolts that hold on the shroud. Um, you're gonna be really happy you did. It makes the installation process go so much easier and it bolts right back on once the front suspension is installed. So again, take, take the shroud off, that's my recommendation. The other tip that we wanna uh, relay to you guys is that when you go to do the actual drilling for the upper control arm for the new uh, Shelby drop holes, is to get yourself one of these. Now this is of course, in case you don't have a drill guide or some other way to make sure that your, your drill is perfectly perpendicular with the drilling surface. Now what this is, is a magnetic square. This is used a lot of times for welding and welders. Um, you can get them for like a buck fifty, two bucks for the small ones at Harbor Freight. I think the larger ones are closer to five dollars, but really cheap investment. Um, the ba way they work is they just magnetically hook onto anything metal and uh, you can use that then to, you put it right below where you're drilling and you can use that to make sure that one, you are perpendicular or square this way with where you're drilling. And then two, when you're looking down the drill, you can make sure that you're square this way so that when you drill, you have a perfectly square hole uh, with respect to the surface that you're drilling into and it's perfectly aligned. Now we didn't do this for the first side, We'd use the half inch drill uh, and we found that without using this guide, we were slightly off. We had to use a round file to dial in the hole just a little bit in order to get it to fit. But on the second side, we did use one of these for both holes and we found that right out of the gate, boom, perfectly perpendicular to the working surface, perfectly square, dead nuts on the first time. We didn't have to adjust anything the upper control arm went right in. So do yourself a favor, spend a few bucks on one of these and it's gonna make your install go, one, a little smoother, but two, you're gonna know it's gonna be bang on perfect. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna keep going. With the drilling surface nice and clean and smooth and flat, we're now going to mount up our street or track provided template so that we can make punch marks for the Shelby drop holes. Now you're gonna start by using the provided hardware in order to mount it through the old holes. Once you've tightened those down from the inside of the engine bay with the provided nut, you're then going to take a punch and then insert them into the small alignment holes to mark your metal for where you're going to drill. Once you've marked your drilling location, you can now remove the hardware as well as the template. Now using a sharp quarter inch drill bit, drill a pilot hole through the shock tower where you made the punch holes. Once you've drilled the pilot holes, now drill using a half inch or 17 30 seconds drill bit to drill to the final hole size. Now, I recommend using either WD-40 or some other kind of lubricant to cool your drill bit and provide a lubricant so that it stays nice and sharp and it's going to aid in your drilling operations. Now, if you were using a half inch drill bit and you found that your hole alignment was slightly off, you can use a rounded file to 
you know, just kind of ease the edges of your holes such that your lower control arm bolts will fit up nicely. Now, even if your lower control arm bolts will fit in the holes, but you still find that it's a little bit tight, you can use a piece of wood and a dead blow mallet to tap them the rest of the way in. Once you've pushed your bolts all the way through the hole, use your hand to just quickly check to make sure that your upper control arm is nice and flush against that shock tower and that there aren't any gaps between the upper control arm and the shock tower steel. Now on the engine bay side, add the lock washers, nuts, and torque them down to 90 foot-pounds. When you finish torquing them down, if it's not already on the ball joint stud, be sure to add the dust boot to the ball joint stud. Now it's time to install the lower control arm. Start by sliding the new lower control arm into the frame where the old lower control arm installed. Once the hole is aligned with the slots in the frame, use the bolt that held in the previous lower control arm to hold in the new lower control arm. Add the non-concentric washer and the nut that held on the previous lower control arm and torque them down to the OEM specs. If you had to loosen the engine cross member in order to get additional clearance to pull out the lower control arm bolt, now is a good time to tighten it back onto the frame. Now it's time to reinstall the spindle. Start by putting the spindle through the stud on either the upper or lower control arms. Then thread on the castle nut until it's finger tight. Now repeat the process for the other control arm. Now note that we want to mention with respect to the lower control arm is that there's actually a spacer that goes between the castle nut and the spindle. Now don't forget to add in that spacer like we did. Once you start to torque down the castle nut, it's going to compress the dust boot, which is going to give you additional clearance in order to get your cotter pin in between your castle nut and the hole in the stud. Again, just don't forget to put it in there. It may not look like it needs it at first, but once you get it torqued down, it becomes pretty apparent that you're going to need that spacer. Now it's time to torque the spindle castle nuts. The lower spindle castle nut is going to be torqued to 75 foot pounds. Now if you find that when you have it finally torqued down that your castle nut does not align with your cotter pin hole, tighten it slightly more, not less, but more to ensure that they are aligned. Now repeat the same process for the upper control arms castle nut, again torquing to 75 foot pounds. 
Once you've torqued down the castle nuts, install the cotter pin through the castle nut and the hole in the stud. Be sure to bend the ends over in opposite directions. You're going to want to bend one over the top of the stud and one around the nut. Now at this point in the episode, I'm actually going to stop and talk a few minutes about our fantastic sponsor, Street or Track. Street or Track is a small company based outside of Detroit, and they specialize in suspension and braking solutions for classic Mustangs. So whether you need a targeted solution, say, I don't know, uh, a Bilstein front coilover suspension system, or maybe you need to overhaul your entire car's brakes and suspension systems. Whatever it is that you have to do, they're gonna work with you and have what you need to make sure that your classic Mustang drives and handles like a brand new car. Um, one of the things that attracted us to Street or Track from the very beginning, aside from the fact that they have extremely affordable solutions that are not only well-built and well-engineered, but they're also extremely easy to implement. So as an example, this front coilover suspension that you see here, entirely bolt-on. With the exception of the optional shell bead drop that can be drilled with just a few holes using this provided template, you can be done in a weekend. And by the end of the weekend, you're basically driving away with a brand new car. Well, not a brand new car, but at least a brand new suspension. So please be sure to check out Streeter Track. The link is going to be down in the description, including the link to this very suspension system that we're implementing today. With all that being said, a huge thank you to our sponsor, Streeter Track, and we're going to get back to the episode. Now it's time to install the strut rod. Start by threading the strut rod tube onto the strut rod frame bracket. Once those have been assembled, place the frame end bracket into the hole in the frame. Now I want to bring up an important note here that I'm trying to, albeit poorly, communicate with my hands. When you install the strut rod into the frame, make sure that the rod end mounting bolt is horizontal or parallel to the ground. If you mount it vertical, it could cause binding and it could cause a possible strut failure. Once you've oriented the strut rod correctly, now slide on the 2.5 inch washer and then the 5 8 nut. Torque those down to 110 foot-pounds. Now while you're torquing down, in order to keep the strut rod from turning on you, there's two different methods that you can use. One, you can use a pry bar or a screwdriver like you see here to keep it in place, or we actually found that just simply holding onto the strut rod was more than enough to hold it in place while we torqued it down to 110 foot-pounds. Now it's time to install the strut rod lower control arm bracket. Make sure that you pick the lower control arm bracket that matches the side of the vehicle that you're working on. These will be labeled with the appropriate sticker. Simultaneously thread in the strut rod tube into the frame bracket and the lower control arm bracket. Once both sides are threaded in, place the lower control arm bracket on top of the lower control arm. Now it's time to install the lower shock mount. There are a couple of ways to make sure that you orient the lower shock mount appropriately. You'll notice that one side is perfectly vertical while the other has a slight slant to it. You'll want the slanted side on the outboard side of the vehicle such that it appears that the slant is leaning in towards the vehicle. The other way that you can tell is by the arrow printed on the bottom of the lower shock mount. You're going to want the arrow pointing to the outside of the vehicle. Now the lower shock mount is mounted through the lower control arm and the strut rod bracket using two half inch bolts. Thread these through the lower control arm and the strut rod bracket and torque them down to 70 foot pounds. Now is a good time to reinstall your sway bar linkage to the lower control arm. 
Now reinstall the steering rod to the spindle. Simply do this using a castle nut and a cotter pin and using the factory OEM torque specs. Now it's time to install the upper shock mount. Now this is arguably the most difficult part of this installation so be sure to take your time and make sure that you do this part correctly. Start by taking your aftermarket export brace and installing it onto the vehicle. Don't worry about installing it onto the shock towers just yet. Start by taking the export brace cover plate and sliding it underneath the export brace. Use this to perfectly align the holes in the export brace and the shock tower. Take your time when doing this as it's critical to make sure that the holes in the shock tower, the aluminum spacer, and the export brace all align. Once you've aligned the cover plate with your drilling location, use the provided punch and a hammer to mark where you're going to make your first drill hole. Remove the cover plate and the export brace and then using a 3 8 inch drill bit, drill your first hole in the punch marked location on the shock tower. Now reinstall the export brace and the cover plate and verify that the holes align. If they do align, place one of the 3 8 bolts through the hole. Now from the other side of the shock tower, take your aluminum spacer ring and thread it through the bolt. Verify that your aluminum spacer ring fits around the coil seat. If everything is aligned and seated correctly, lightly tighten the nut down onto the aluminum spacer ring to hold it in place. Once you've verified that everything is still aligned on the upper side of the shock tower, use the provided punch to make your next drilling hole punch mark. Be sure to remove the aluminum cylinder ring from the other side of the shock tower before you start drilling. You don't want to accidentally drill a new hole into the aluminum spacer ring. Now repeat the same process by threading in the bolts and applying the aluminum cylinder ring and lightly threading it into place. You can repeat the same steps as earlier and use the punch on the top side of the shock tower to mark your drilling location. However, we found it was actually pretty useful to just drill from the underside since we already had the aluminum spacer ring put in place and it acted as a drill guide to verify that we were always going to get perfect alignment. Do one last fit check before installing the full upper shock mount assembly. Now to install the full upper shock mount assembly, you're actually going to install the cover plate on top of the export brace before threading in your bolts. Once you've threaded in your bolts, put on your aluminum spacer ring and then thread on your upper shock mount bracket. Use the serrated hex nuts to hold the installation in place until it's ready for final torque. Torque the bolts down to 40 foot pounds. Be sure to torque them down from the head side of the bolt on the top side of the shock tower and not from the serrated hex nuts. This is because if you tighten them from the serrated hex nuts, they're going to strip away from the material in the bracket and they're not going to hold as well. 
Now it's time to install the shock itself. Now to do this, start by placing it roughly in the location that it's meant to be. Again, this is one of those times where it's really helpful to have removed the coil shroud in order to give yourself some more room to work with. Start by getting it roughly into place in the upper shock mount bracket. Place a spacer on either side of the shock and then secure it in place using the half inch grade eight bolt. Torque this down to 50 foot pounds. To install the shock to the lower control arm, start by using a floor jack to lift up the lower control arm until the shock is roughly aligned with the lower shock mounting bracket. Just like with the upper shock mount, put a spacer on either side of the shock and then secure it in place using the half inch bolt. Torque this bolt down to 50 foot pounds. Once the shock is installed, add grease to the upper and lower ball joints using the supplied grease nuts. Once you've added grease to the upper and lower ball joints, remove the grease nuts and replace them with the supplied button head cap screws. This will make sure that the grease nuts don't get beat up over time and don't get grimy and your suspension stays in good working condition. So that's one half of the car done. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and switch over to the other half of the car. And by we, I mean me. Uh, I'm gonna be doing this half solo by myself. Um, we're gonna be showing this one in time-lapse. So if uh, you don't feel like watching for a couple of minutes to watch us go through the other half, feel free to skip to the end of the video. Uh, but I'm gonna keep rolling on this.
Now because this was a temporary installation for us before we stripped the car down for blasting, we didn't talk about aligning the wheels with respect to camber, caster, and tow. Now camber is defined as the measure of a tire centerline relative to the surface of the road. This is measured in degrees with positive angles being the top of the wheel pointing away from the car and negative degrees with the top of the wheel being pointed towards the car. Now the ideal camber setting for the street application of this suspension is between zero and negative half degrees. Now caster is defined as the angle from vertical that the steering axis of the vehicle is. Positive caster is defined when the wheel is in front of the upper pivot point and negative is the opposite. The ideal caster setting is between positive 3 degrees and a positive 5 degrees. Toe is defined as the direction the tires are pointed relative to the vehicle's centerline when viewed from above. Toe in is when the tires are pointed inwards towards the center of the car and toe out is when the wheels are pointed outward. Toe in is considered positive angle, toe out is considered negative angle. The ideal setting for the street or track suspension is 1 16th to 1 8th of an inch toe in. Now we won't be going over the specifics of how to adjust the alignment on your car. This is something that's in the instructions and to be honest, something that we're not necessarily qualified to do. Um, but if you have any questions, do feel free to call up street or track or go see a local alignment specialist to make sure that your car is aligned properly with your new suspension. So right there at the end, the battery from the main filming camera and the GoPro both ran out of juice. So we didn't capture the very, very end, but there wasn't much left. Fortunately, we were just putting on the wheel hub and then we were going to put back on the tire. So no major loss there. However, that pretty much wraps up the installation of the front coilover suspension. I mean, it took us a weekend and I did one side entirely by myself. And so I hope that shows that you can too. We did everything using hand tools for the most part, save for the drilling applications. Um, so if you have more sophisticated tools, that's gonna save you some time, but don't let that discourage you. I think we've shown that any weekend warrior uh, can do this in their garage on a weekend by themselves using hand tools, um, provided that they just have the time to, uh, to do it. So other than that, it was really easy and it looks so good. And I honestly cannot wait to go and drive on it. And it's killing me that I can't right now because the motor's out of the car, um, but you know, c'est la vie. Um, other than that, I want to give a huge thank you to the sponsors of this video and the sponsors of the front coilover suspension street or track. Um, not only just for being sponsors, but also you guys have been absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, please go check out their products at streetertrack.com. The link is going to be down in the description, as well as a link to this specific unit that we installed on our Mustang. Um, those guys are great to work with. If you need a targeted solution or very something specific, you know, call them up, talk to them. I'm sure they'll get you, you know, set away straight so that you have what you need, whatever your performance goals are with respect to your suspension. Um, so again, a huge thank you to Streeter Track for being a sponsor. Uh, and a huge thank you to you guys for watching. I hope this has been informative. I hope it's been entertaining. Um, we've got some great content coming again here in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, I will see you guys next time.